Hello everyone and welcome to British Murders, the podcast that focuses exclusively on British murder cases with an occasional glimpse at horror movies. I'm your host as ever Stuart Blues and this is now the fourth episode of season four. This past weekend I visited Bowler's Exhibition Centre in Manchester for a fan convention named For the Love of Horror. As you can imagine the event celebrates the horror genre as a whole and it's organised by UK events company Monopoly Events. I was accompanied by my mate Brett Curtis, who featured on my movie review episode of Jordan Peele's Us from 2019. We're typically not convention goers, but we thought it'd be a laugh, and it certainly was. There was a scare maze at the event, which, to be fair, did scare me a little bit due to all the people jumping out and grabbing you, but it's fair to say that Brett was petrified. The guy said to us, is either one of you feeling particularly brave? We both agreed that I was, because I'm hard, but he shoved us through the same door, whereas some other people that were sort of splitting him up. I went first, Brett was behind me, and it, <laughs> there was one time where you had to do a bit of crawling, and I was walking down a corridor, a guy came straight out the dark in my face, scared the shit out of me, crawled through. It was jump scary, Brett was holding on to me by the end. Someone grabbed my leg, thought it was Brett, it wasn't. I don't think they were supposed to touch her, but never mind. I didn't get a picture with any of the guests at the event. I did bump into Lorraine from Once Upon a Nightmare. She's even smaller in real life, by the way. She was such a wimp that she refused to go into the scare maze, even if I went with her. She's a wuss. But anyway, that would have made it far worse, she said. Make of that what you will. I think that's quite cruel. But <laughs> like I say, you didn't have to crawl through mud or anything, but you just had to crawl for a little bit of it, and that was too much for her, so whatever. But with that being said, let's move on to our first opening icebreaker segment. I don't even think that's a sentence. Opening icebreaker segment. We'll roll with it. It's time for this. Welcome to Daddy Facts. As you just heard, this segment is called Daddy Facts or Dad Facts. It involves me reading out a random dad fact from a pack of cards my daughter got me a few years ago. And here is this week's fact, pre-prepared. I've not read it though. It says, to give the perfect handshake, you want the webbing between the thumb and index finger of your hand to meet the same spot on the other person's hand. Be sure to make eye contact and to smile. I think I've got a decent handshake. So the webbing is this bit, if you can see on the video. That has to meet... Well, that's not going to work, is it? It has to meet... Yeah. Next time I shake hands, I'll remember that. So when we're lost in the woods, or we're lost on a desert island handshake with the locals might just keep you alive with that done let's go on to the second and final opening icebreaker segment of the show the serial killer's book of haiku Hiya! here is this week's haiku <gasps> child sleeps silently i sit calmly savoring breathing intertwined there we go as a reminder, a haiku is a Japanese poem made up of 17 syllables in three lines of five, seven, and five, and it's meant to be read in one breath. The book I've just shown you there is called The Serial Killer's Book of Haiku by Rose Bundy. There's a link to it in my bio if you are interested. But without further ado, let's get into this week's episode. This case was suggested by listener Craig Jones. Craig sent an email to britishmurderspodcast at gmail.com in August with a case suggestion that he has a personal connection to. Craig actually grew up with the son of this week's villain, and he lived on the same road as him. Now, as with all case suggestions, I added the case to my episode list, and here we are. As a reminder, this fourth season is made up entirely of listener-suggested cases, so if you want me to cover a case and get a shout-out, please do get in touch. The best way is via email, but you can reach out via social media if you prefer. As always, let's start with a look at the area where this story takes place. This week, we're in the Greater Manchester village of Lowton. This is slightly off topic, but one of the lads I play football with is from Manchester, and he told me that Greater Manchester is a county. I and a few of the other lads didn't believe him. We insisted that he was actually thinking of Lancashire. After a quick Google, though, we had to admit that we were wrong, although technically it did used to fall under the historic county of Lancashire. Regardless, that was a tough pill to swallow. But back to Lowton. It's located within the metropolitan borough of Wigan, within the county of Greater Manchester. Isn't English geography fun? 
I'll be honest here and say that the only bits of information I could find out about this village were on Wikipedia. So as with anything from that site, please take it with a pinch of salt. Here's what I found. The Hare and Hounds public house built in the 17th century was once used as a place to hold trials of local criminals, including murderers. The Lowton stocks can still be found today nearby at St Luke's Parish Church and are Grade 2 listed. Lowton's Sandy Lane is apparently haunted by the ghost of Joshua Rigby, a local farmer who died in 1883. During the Industrial Revolution, Lowton was associated with coal mining and manufacturing. And finally, Lowton's history is closely connected with Byram Manor, the ancestral home of the Byrams, a family which included poet John Byram. Let's now introduce the villain of this week's episode. Annoyingly, he shares the same name as me. It's even spelt the same way. His name is Stuart Hulse. S-T-U-A-R-T. How dare he? This British murder story, it is a brutal one, by the way. There's going to be a heavy focus on hardcore pornography within the episode. As ever, feel free to sit this one out if you think the aforementioned topics are likely to be hard for you to hear graphic details about. Stuart Hulse's background was that of a soldier. Born in either 1961 or 1962, I've done some working backwards as always, Hulse served in the British Army in both Northern Ireland and the Falklands. So if we're doing some logical maths, we can work out that he would have been either 20 or 21 during the Falklands War, as that took place between April and June 1982. With regards to serving in Northern Ireland, it makes sense that his time there related to the Northern Ireland conflict, or simply the Troubles, which lasted roughly 30 years from the late 1960s to the late 1990s. Perhaps it was his time spent in war zones that led to his sick fascination with hardcore pornographic films. Despite being married, Hulse got his kicks from watching violent porn movies at sex parties with dozens of other people. If you're like me, you'll be wondering what the legalities of pornography are in the UK. No? Just me? Well, let me tell you, I hope you do appreciate the following information because my search history is now very suspect. According to Part 5 of the Criminal Justice and Immigration Act 2008, it's a criminal offence to be in possession of extreme pornographic images. But what do I mean by that? Cover your ears if you're squeamish. I won't put any pictures on the video, don't worry, that would be uh, a bad time. An extreme pornographic image is one that falls under the following criteria. First of all, it's pornographic, naturally, by which I mean its sole purpose is to sexually arouse the viewer. Secondly, it's to be grossly offensive, disgusting, or otherwise of an obscene character. Interpret that how you will. And finally, it displays at least one or more of the following. This is where it gets tasty. An act that threatens a person's life. An act that results or is likely to result in serious injury to a person's anus, breasts, or genitals. An act that involves sexual interference with a human corpse, or necrophilia. A person performing an act of intercourse or oral sex with an animal, whether dead or alive, so that's your bestiality side. An act which involves the non-consensual penetration of a person's vagina, anus or mouth by another with the other person's penis or part of the other person's body or anything else. And a reasonable person looking at the image would think that the persons or animals were real. It's basically rape. That information was taken directly from the Crown Prosecution Services website, so thanks for that CPS. But back now to Stuart Hulse. Aside from his army background and his preference for hardcore sex films, what else do we know about him? We know he was married, but he also had two sons with his wife. You might think, how does a seemingly ordinary guy end up being the villain of a true crime podcast? It all started one Friday evening in June 1996. It was June 7th, 1996, if you want the specific date. You know those Friday nights where you can either choose to stay in with your partner while the kids are in bed, or you can go to a sex party and watch violent pornography with your mates? It were one of those evenings. Hulse was invited to the party by Dorothy Atherton, another Lowton resident who'd known him since she was 15. According to Dorothy, she trusted Hulse completely and saw him as a friend. Here is where the story takes an early twist as well. Dorothy said the party was just a decent drink with friends and not a sordid sex party. Of the 11 people who went, she said only two couples paired up and those who did were in strong and lasting relationships. 
I take it from that she means that two couples went away to different bedrooms to get jiggy with it and they were long-term partners. Dorothy invited Hulse because he was on his own and she admitted there was a hardcore sex tape playing but that she didn't watch it. Yeah, right. First of all, if you're going to a party with a video like the one I'm about to describe playing, it's definitely a sordid sex party. And secondly, if you're attending said party and inviting married men to said party, you definitely watch the video. So let's take a minute to discuss this infamous pirated porn video. It was allegedly 15 to 18 minutes long and showed a woman having her hands chained behind her back and her legs restrained. After that, the woman was sexually abused in a variety of ways by at least one man. If that wasn't weird enough, the whole thing was playing with classical music in the background. I don't think the likes of Beethoven, Bach or Mozart would have anticipated that their music would be set to such a film. Maybe they did, who knows. According to Hulse this time, after watching the movie, the five couples attending started to disappear to different rooms to rock the casbah, as it were. Remember, Hulse was the odd man out. He was number 11. As a result, he became incredibly pissed off because he was horny as all hell and had no partner with him at the party. What he should have done, ideally, was sort himself out, if you catch my drift. Instead, his sexual frustration turned to a murderous rage. He left the party, but bizarrely, he wasn't alone. He shared a taxi with his mate Dorothy, who had invited him. That's where the story sort of crosses wires for me, because if it was a sex party and all of the couples went to separate bedrooms, surely Dorothy would have been in there with her partner. Instead, she shared a taxi home with Hulse, which makes me think that it wasn't a sex festival after all. Regardless, the taxi dropped the pair off not far from Hulse's home on Slag Lane. I promise you I'm not making up that street name. I assume they both got out the taxi where Dorothy lived, and Hulse said he'd walk the rest of the way to his house as it wasn't too far away. What Dorothy didn't realise is that Hulse didn't go straight home. As he walked down Allaby Way, he spotted a 46-year-old woman named Shirley Brown collecting milk from outside her house. Shirley was a divorcee whose 10-year-old son Richard was spending the weekend with his father David. She'd only been home for a couple of hours as she'd been revising at her friend Deborah Mann's house. Shirley was a mature student at St Helens College and she had an upcoming exam in A-level English. The friends had been watching videos of Shakespeare's Othello in preparation for the exam. Hulse took his opportunity while Shirley's guard was down and snuck into her semi-detached bungalow. He waited for the perfect time to take Shirley by surprise and did so by hitting her in the head so hard that it knocked her unconscious. While she was out cold, Hulse tied her feet together using one of her bras, tied her hands behind her back and used a pair of her knickers to gag her. Once tied up and completely helpless, Hulse reenacted the video he'd seen earlier and carried out a brutal sexual assault on Shirley. After that, Hulse used a pair of Shirley's tights to strangle her to death. During the attack, some of Shirley's neighbours said they heard a scream, but the police were never called. Now, I guess that's fair enough, because if you did hear a solitary scream, you'd likely wait to hear another one before raising the alarm. After killing Shirley, Hulse left her body under the duvet in one of the bungalow's three bedrooms. Once the weekend was coming to a close, ten-year-old Richard was dropped off by his dad and grew concerned when he couldn't find his mum. It seems odd to me that David didn't wait to see Shirley greet their son before he drove off, but then again, maybe they didn't have a civil relationship. Richard was ten, I suppose, so maybe he had his own key or just let himself in. Who knows? After searching the house and being unable to find his mum, Richard informed their semi-detached neighbours. My sources indicate that an off-duty policeman was next door at the time Richard went over, but it's unclear as to whether the neighbour himself was an off-duty policeman or if one just happened to be visiting. Regardless, the officer searched the property and discovered Shirley's body under the duvet. Given the size of the small community, police interviewed most of the local residents, including Stuart Hulse. He, of course, denied even knowing Shirley Brown. He explained that he was at a party on Friday evening but said that he went straight home afterwards and fell asleep. DNA samples were recovered from Shirley's body and the police were in the process of organising a mass DNA screening of men in the local area. Police interviewed 5,000 males living within a half mile radius of the murder scene and they took DNA swabs from 300 of them. During that process they took a blood sample from Stuart Hulse and before the results came back 
he came forward and changed his story. Hulse explained that he did in fact know Shirley and that the two had been having an affair. Despite admitting that, Hulse was adamant that he had an alibi for the night of the murder and insisted he had nothing to do with it. Once the police got the DNA results back, they matched Hulse's DNA profile with that of semen found on Shirley's body. It was a 150 million to one match. It was him. Hulse maintained his innocence for months in spite of all the evidence against him, and due to his constant denial, the case was set to go to trial. I'm not a poet. But that all changed after Hulse finally came clean in January 1998 and admitted to killing Shirley Brown. Stuart Hulse changed his plea from not guilty to guilty at Manchester Crown Court on January 16, 1998. Five days later, he was sentenced to life imprisonment on January 21st, 1998. Attempting to figure out Hulse's motive, police believe it was simply a case of becoming sexually frustrated due to not having a partner at the party. After the case had concluded, Shirley Brown was posthumously awarded her A-level in English Literature and an award for outstanding student achievement has been set up in her honour. Anne Winterton, who was the Conservative Party Member of Parliament for Congleton at the time, called for urgent government action to curb the availability of hardcore porn films. She said, This case gives the lie to those who claim, with supposed authority, that violence on the media does not affect the behaviour of people who watch it. Stuart Hulse's case was reviewed on February 1st, 2008 by High Court Judge Mr Justice Tear. Hulse was told at the Royal Courts of Justice in London that, taking into account the time he spent in custody before his sentencing, it will be November 2013 before he can even apply for parole. That essentially meant that he was handed a retrospective minimum term of 17 years. Mr Justice Tear said the savagery and brutality of Hulse's attack on Shirley Brown was such that 17 years was the very least he should serve for the murder. Hulse's legal team made the argument that their client had made what they described as positive progress whilst in prison. In particular, they alluded to Hulse's participation in a sex offender treatment program. I did a tiny bit of research to find out what happens in a sex offender treatment program RIP my search history, honestly, and the goals appear to be as follows. To increase sexual knowledge, to modify thinking patterns that may have previously been used by offenders to excuse and justify their behaviour, to develop the ability to recognise risk factors and to generate strategies for living successful lives without offending in the future. Despite all that, Judge Tia said, I am not persuaded that it is appropriate to take this into account because it is difficult to see how such progress mitigates the seriousness of the offence. It is not said to be exceptional progress and it does not appear to be such. If it were correct to take it into account, it could not in my judgment serve to reduce the minimum period. It's worth noting that Hull served 15 months and 20 days behind bars before he was sentenced and that time counts towards his minimum term. Once the 17 years are up, which was 8 years ago at this point, Hulse can only be released if he can convince the parole board he is no longer a risk to the public and will then remain on licence for life, subject to prison recall if he puts a foot wrong. I wasn't able to find out if he has been released, but I'm hoping the lack of media coverage about that means that he remains behind bars to this day. And that was the story of British murderer Stuart Hulse. Thanks again to Craig Jones for suggesting that case. I've got two new reviews to read out this week. Firstly, thank you C Dalton 96 for leaving British Murders a five-star rating and review on iTunes. They said, I love this podcast. I stumbled across this last week while searching for a good true crime show and don't regret my decision. Every episode is brilliantly narrated and well thought out. How nice is that? Thank you as well to Shaz2118 for leaving British Murders a five-star rating and review on iTunes. Shaz said, Found you on TikTok and so glad I did. I've been binge listening ever since. Some really interesting cases. Just wish the episodes were longer. I'm glad you stumbled across me on the old TikTok. I've got nearly 300,000 followers on there. Soz. But the length of my episodes are such that it allows me sufficient time to write, record and edit on a weekly basis but more importantly, it's the length which I enjoy when I actually listen to other people's podcasts. 
basically I designed it to fit my own personal preference. So that's why the episodes are the length that they are. Thanks again to both C Dalton 96 and Shaz2118 there for your kind words. Sometimes all it takes is to read a nice little review and it gives you such a boost, honestly. It makes it all worthwhile. If you'd like to review the show and have it read on a future episode, you can do so on iTunes or Podchaser. It's great to hear from my listeners and all reviews help increase the show's exposure. For more on British Murders, please check out all my social media channels and YouTube. Merchandise can be purchased at Teespring. You can support the show on Patreon and buy me a coffee. Remember to email me some case suggestions to britishmurderspodcast at gmail.com or via social media. You'll not only get the episode covered, but you'll get a shout out as well. Come on, dude, let's do it. That's it for now, though. I've been Stuart Blues. This has been British Murders. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time. Cheerio.